The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we'll discuss the basics of using a PIC32 microcontroller in a Chipkit Max32 development package. We'll go over what makes a PIC32 different from AVRs we've used in the past and show some examples of it in action. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today in Ben News, I wanted to show you this gas pump that I'm working on for AMD. They're like, hey, do something cool with a gas pump in one of our computers. And I'm like, okay, how about a jukebox? So I took out the panel here, the uh, dials and the, you know, the white panel, and I put in an LCD with a black bezel. Uh, so it looks kind of cool. This is a 16 inch LED backlit LCD. So it's nice and thin and it fit between the glass and the red frame of the unit. And the cool thing you can do is actually run Winamp using your phone. So yeah, it's uh, hopefully it'll be pretty cool once we have some speakers in it and uh, I will definitely have it in a future update once I have it completely finished. Okay, what song shall I listen to? There are some differences between the PIC32 and the AVR that we should go over. Differences that could cause problems if you're not aware of them. First of all, it's 3.3 volt instead of 5 volt. That's the voltage it runs off of. Also the voltage that are on its I.O. pins. Not all of its pins are 5 volt tolerant. 5 volt tolerance means if you have a 3.3 volt microcontroller, you can still have a 5 volt input digital I.O. into the pins and it'll be fine. Some of the pins on the PIC32 are tolerant, some aren't. So it's just best to assume that they all aren't. Also, there are no internal pull-ups. Pull-up, as you may have seen us use on the show before, is a resistor that pulls a pin high or low and keeps it in that state unless it's changed by an external force. The AVRs can enable internal pull-ups where it does that on the chip. You don't need external resistors. The PIC32 does not have internal pull-ups, therefore you always need to use physical external resistors to pull up and pull down. It's usually a good idea to do that anyway, so it's not really that much of a problem. I rarely use the internal pull-ups on the AVR myself. But these are all voltage-related things that are important to keep in mind. All right, let's get started with the Chipkit IDE. We can find it online by searching for Chipkit IDE. Here it is in the Digilet website. You just click here and download it. It comes as one large folder that you can put wherever you want, just like Arduino does. Uh, we have it here in my program files. This is the program itself, MPIDE. So next we're gonna go into Device Manager, make sure we have the drivers. I'm gonna plug in the chip kit. Chip kit comes in two sizes, the larger Max32 and the smaller Uno32. They're both the same speed. The Max32 has more program space, RAM, and I.O. Okay, we have the serial drivers for this. See the USB serial port? But if you don't have the drivers, what you do is you click on the offending thing, which will have an exclamation mark on it, at least in Windows. Go to Browse My Computer for Driver Software, and you're going to find the drivers in the same folder as the IDE. So you just hit that, and it'll find the, find the files. All right. Here's the IDE itself. Uh, it works just like Arduino. It even has its own sample library, some of which have been changed for the PIC32, but 99% of it is exactly the same, so it's very easy to get into. I'm going to use a standard Blink example, but I'm gonna change the pin number just so it's easier to get at. And I'm also gonna remove the delay, so it'll be blinking it as fast as possible. We can hook that up to an oscilloscope and then compare the speed directly to an AVR Arduino. Here's the Arduino that we programmed to blink as fast as possible. Gonna hook it up here. Lights on, but it's actually blinking very rapidly. So we're gonna hook it up to this um, Agilent oscilloscope, and that will show us how fast it's actually running. Hook it up. All right, so we have it set to auto scale, and it's showing us the frequency, about 118 kilohertz, or that would be 0.118 megahertz. So that's how fast it can go. Of course, you have to think going high and then going low, those are both cycles, so the frequency is actually, uh, you know, 236 kilohertz, but still, you know, not nearly as fast as 16 megahertz because there's other things going on below the hood. Now let's program the chip kit. All right, so here's how we're gonna speed it up. Here's the code for the digital write and read in pin mode. If you look at it, there's actually quite a bit of things happen. You have to go to pin mode and all this happens and it's based off a diagram using what chip you're using. 
on. Look at this is the whole code just to do one digital right. Look at all that. That consumes time. And the reason there's so much code is because it's um, ported over to multiple different processors and systems. So we're going to do it in a simpler way. We're going to use the port command. We still want to use pin 32. So I'm going to look at this list I have here. And I see pin 32 is port G bit 6. See how I've got a list here? All right. So now that I know that, I can program it. All right, here we are back in our program again. I've removed the original code. First thing I have to do, instead of pin mode, I'm going to actually set it using the uh, tri-state register, which is different than the uh, Arduino. The Arduino uses a DDR for direction rate for port. So here's tri-state G. It's going to set the direction of our pins. And we're going to use a bit shifting because we can't use 16-bit numbers in this program, at least expressed as binary. So we bit shift eight bits to the left to put that in the MSBs. And then the pin we want, which is six over, that's right here. We make that a zero and the rest are ones. Uh, it's backwards on the pick. When you're setting your direction, uh, one means an input. You can kind of think of it as one, looks like an I, input I. And a zero means output. Think of it output O, zero. That's an easy way to think about it since it's different than the AVRs. Now down here in loop, we're not gonna use digital write. We're gonna do it this way. We say port G or equals one bit shift six to the left. And this may look similar to the code that we wrote when we did our AVR programming before using AVR Studio. Are we gonna send command port G and equals inverse of one bit shift to the left by six. All right, now that'll do the same thing as the digital write code that we did, but it'll do it much faster. Now we can look at the oscilloscope and see how much speed that actually gained us. Here's the chip kit running the same code, digital write on and off as fast as possible. Let's see what it has for frequency. All right, we set it to auto scale again and the Agilent scope is telling us the frequency is about 0.67 megahertz. So yes, it's pretty much exactly five times faster than the Arduino was. So you might be thinking, okay, it's 80 megahertz. So why is it not getting 80 megahertz of speed? Well, first of all, you know, digital high is a state, digital low is a state, so that's two year cycles right there. So that's actually running at, again, about 1.5 megahertz, but you know, where's the rest of it? Well, it's a um, high level C language, which has been compiled down to machine language on the chip. So that actually eats up a lot of overhead. Also the digital write function, when you call that, it goes into another section of code and there's a bunch of code that actually consists of the digital write and that sucks up a lot of time. So having a high level language on top of the fact that you have a bunch of abstraction layers for the Arduino compatibility. So having a lot of layers of code just to do one thing, digital write, it makes it easy when you're programming it, but it also slows it down. That's kind of how life works. The faster way to do it is to use low level port access. Now that we set the tri-state direction as outputs, we need to go down here and we type lat g, which is the latch for that output or equals one, bit shift six to the left, and we also invert. And one, bit shift, bit shift six to the left. That will do the same thing as tiling digital write on and off. It'll just do it faster. So we'll upload that code and then compare it to our other speeds. Here is the chip kit that we programmed to do the same thing but using the port command instead of the digital write commands. Let's look up to the scope. So we're up to about 3.77 megahertz instead of 0.77 megahertz. The uh, same microcontroller, but we're going much faster. And that's because we're not doing any of that digital write stuff. We know exactly what port and bit of the port we're using, and we can do it much faster. So it's a good trick. If you can do that in your program, just look up what port it is, any microcontroller, AVR, PIC, just look up what the pin is, propeller, look up what the pin is, and then you can make it go a lot faster instead of doing the slow, low level commands. I actually had to slow it down a little bit so the scope would get an accurate reading. So it's actually probably about twice as fast as this even. So instead of pulsing the pin at you know, 0.77 megahertz, we're probably doing it closer to 10 megahertz, which is pretty good. It's only taken a few operations or instructions to actually execute that port command. All right, so that's an example of you know, the speed difference between an Arduino and a PIC32, and a PIC32 using digital write, and a PIC32 using port access. So now we're gonna give you a better example of port access. We're gonna use an entire 16-bit port to drive a light matrix. Ticket invalid. Please insert paid ticket. 
You are going the wrong way. Recalculating. Your current balance is zero. You have no new messages. Hello. Thank you for oh. calling. Oh, I have been on hold all day. This all is of our so... operators are busy now. Goodbye. Oh. Getting the personal, friendly service you're looking for. Not as easy as it used to be. Getting personal, reliable, and fast service from our friendly account specialists. Ah, a whole lot easier. Discover how we're listening to your feedback and building a better experience. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Now we're going to look at how you can use port access to drive something quickly, like a large amount of things. And we're going to do a light matrix, or light driver, which I appear to have written here. So here's an entire port on the PIC32. Get zero through seven, one byte, port B. Eight through 15, the second byte of port B. The lower bytes or bits are called the least significant bits, and then these are the most significant bits. We're gonna separate it into two bytes. But you can access this whole thing in one shot, one operation, which is way faster than using digital write. So an example, we're gonna drive some lights. We're gonna use the lights off of my new Ghost Squad pinball system that I've made, and it uses a light matrix where it has eight columns and eight rows and the interface like this to give you 64 total adjustable lights, only using 16 lines of data. So we're gonna hook up the column lines. We're just gonna hook up a, a two by four matrix of lights because you know it'll get the point across. This will be column zero, comes into the LEDs, and then the LEDs come into rows zero, one, two, three. And then you have your second column here. And so the reason it's gonna be good to have low level fast access is because we need to pulse these lights. Only one column is on at a time. It's like do, 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 do. You just do it so quickly that they appear to be always on. And by using the low level port access, we can do it quickly. So we're gonna drive them here and then we'll bring them into the row here. So column drives it and row syncs it basically. So it's voltage and sync and we can do it very quickly. So we'll move on to the computer and use that to do our example. Now that we've explained how the lights work, we can write the code for it. I'm using Notepad++ to write this code because it's just easier to use in the IDE. The IDE, you can switch it to preferences, use external editor, and you can use an external editor. Kind of simple. Okay, so we're using interrupts here. You see we have uh, this timer here, and it's going to activate 16,000 times a second. So this code will run 16,000 times a second, no matter what else is going on in your program. However, your interrupt code should be short because it happens so often. And what it basically does is we have a variable, or an array actually, called light, and there's eight bytes in that, and each byte has eight bits, eight times eight, 64 lights. So what we do every cycle, remember this lat B from before, that allows us to you know, change port B. We're actually just gonna put the data from the lights onto port B directly. And again, we put the upper bytes here, or the upper byte, the MSB, we move it over to the left, and then we add the column. So the row and the column data, two bytes, 16 bits, we just dump it directly onto the port. So instead of having to like do every pin individually, it's like one shot, which means it's fast. So that's a great way to, you know, program things quickly for your AVR or your PIC32. You save it here in Notepad and then you go over to your kernel program or, you know, where you have it open. See how it's grayed out? I can't actually edit it here, but I do need to upload it. And this will go to our board and we will see that our lights are lit up. And we're using the new prototype pinball board that I have. It's PIC32 based, so it's a great way to show off how to use the port access for maximum speed. The switch matrix also works the same way. Just, it's just like the lights, eight by eight. One of them is an input instead of an output, but it still goes directly to a full 16 bit port for high speed access. Here's our lights right here. So we have our two columns, column, column, and then a row goes this way. Now there's an advanced technique we can use, which is called pulse width modulation. They're already at a one eighth duty cycle where a row of lights is only on, you know, one out of eight cycles. It's like, doo, 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 doo. you just do it so fast you can't even see. Well, you can actually do it even faster than that. And by pulsing the bits even faster, you can appear to make it dimmer or brighter. So I'm going to do that code now. I've got a separate version of this. I'm gonna load up, okay. And uh, it's useful to say your languages C. 
And one thing that's nice about using Notepad++ is see how all the things are open? You can collapse them like this, or hit Alt-0 to collapse all of them. Very useful. I'm gonna scroll down to our external C code. Again, interrupts are beyond the scope of this uh, demonstration, but there's information online if you wanna check it out. All right, here we go. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to do the same thing where it cycles the set of eight lights, but on top of going one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, it's going to go eight past that, which is called the pulse width modulation counter. You have your set of eight lights, and then that, those being controlled is one cycle, and then you have eight total cycles. And how often a light is illuminated in that eight cycle is how bright it is. So if it's illuminated for all eight cycles, that light's gonna be very bright. If it's only illuminated for two cycles, it's gonna be very dim, or no cycles, it's gonna be off. Uh, yeah, so let me show you an example. You saw those lights right there, they're being driven with the port, but they're basically binary. With this, we can do all sorts of stuff. We can pulse it, we can strobe it, and we can blink it. So I'm gonna make light zero pulse, lights one and two be bright and dim, and then light three will blink. Pretty cool, huh? And we're doing that all with a low level port access. Again, you saw earlier in the episode how digital write is kind of slow. We really wouldn't be able to do that with digital write or well, we wouldn't be able to do anything else. This has been a great example of how we can use the PIC32's higher speed and multiple full size ports to drive lights, for instance, very easily. So there you go, a basic overview of the PIC32. And the PIC32 in this form is called the chip kit. It comes just like this, and it's Arduino mega compatible, but it's five times faster, 32-bit with more I.O. You can get it at element14.com. Check it out, it might be a great thing to use in your next project. My rant today is about sleep. Why do I have to sleep? Imagine how much more work I could get done if I could work during my leisure hours and play games when I previously was sleeping. Maybe someday there will be a hack of the human brain to solve this, but I probably won't live to see it, or I won't be gaming by that time. My rave today is the news we're likely going to get some new game consoles this year. Finally, it will be very interesting to see what modern video cards are capable of once they're no longer held back by last gen console ports. Fingers crossed. Today's viewer question comes from John who asks, any advice about purchasing tools like a screwdriver, Allen wrench, crowbar, hammer, etc.? How does one tell the cheap tool from the good? Well, John, you get what you pay for. Try and avoid cheap house brands from big box stores. They're made of low grade metals and they won't last. One avenue for larger power tools could be to buy used or get at a pawn shop. If a tool is old enough and valuable enough to be resold, that means it's gonna last. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, I'll share some tips on how to not fry your projects. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.